We're going to go on to, uh, to you now. And uh, there were some sign-in sheets when you came in. I'm going to try to follow those. But you may have a question you didn't sign up that you wanted to speak. But there is going to be a meeting summary prepared by the NRC that will be on the website. Uh, and there will also be the, the webcast. So let's hear from a few people. And then you've been sitting for a long time, so we'll take a short, short break then. But uh, you've heard uh, the community engagement panel uh, mentioned. And we have several members here from the community engagement panel. But I'm going uh, to go to Dan Stetson first for some, some comments from the panel. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dan Stetson, and I'm the secretary for the Community Engagement Panel. I want to once, once again uh, compliment Songs, uh, Southern California Edison, for putting it together. We've had quite a number of public meetings uh, where you've been able to come and ask questions, and we welcome those. We've even had continuing workshops uh, at the Ocean Institute, where I work on an ongoing basis. Uh, a couple of us were, had the opportunity to come and meet this morning. David Victor, who's chairman of the uh, CEP, Tim Brown, myself, and uh, we're able to meet with some members of the NRC. And I just want to share with you just a couple quick takeaways from that meeting. Number one big takeaway for me was that the NRC is not going away. They're here with us every step of the way. There are eyes, there are ears, there are inspectors, and they're the ones that are really going to walk us through this entire process, through the decommissioning and then also through the continued storage of the fuel there on site. So that process is going to be very important, and we're really looking to them to, to manage this. Also, as I looked out in that room this morning, I couldn't help but be impressed with the depth of experience of the folks that are there. Quite honestly, they're different than you and I. You, you know, we think we all speak English, but so much of it comes across as Greek. But I want to thank them for trying to bring it to a level, even this evening, or something that we can all really understand. But no matter what, I think we're all really interested in one thing, and that's the ongoing safety for the storage. We know that the fuel is going to be there for an extended period of time. We don't really know how long. We want it out of there as soon as possible. But as Al was saying, None of our cars are going to last for 100 years, and something's going to need to be done if something comes up. So all of us are interested, if the worst case happens, do we have the plan and the resources to take care of us? All of us want to trust, but we need the NRC to validate our trust. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Another organization that started uh, very soon after the decision was made to shut the plants down was the coalition to de decommission San Onofre. And uh, we're going to go to Gene Stone. Hi. I'm Gene Stone from Residents Organized for a Safe Environment. I'm also a member of the California Edison CEP. Um, and I'm happy to do that and, and happy to be here tonight. I'd like to thank the NRC for uh, hearing our comments today. And I'm happy to see so many friends that are here to support uh, uh, this whole process and the environment. I must say that uh, I'm not really uh, happy uh, because I no longer believe that, the, in, that California Edison is considered, considering doing the state-of-the-art decommissioning that they promised at the first community engagement panel, nor do I believe that the NRC will demand or require that of them. But unfortunately, a more standard approach to decommissioning. The NRC should have a more proactive approach to California's PSDAR. The fact that the NRC does not approve or disapprove this minimalist, minimalist approach to the safe storage of nuclear waste is very disappointing and alarming to me. Going forward with a plan that uses canisters that were designed for short-term storage does not make sense. It seems that we would be better served if the NRC would 
take a stronger approach in leading the industry into developing a much more robust and uh, canister system with defense in depth, not just talking about defense in depth, but real action items that the public can see uh, that will uh, help us in any situation that might arise. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, and we're going to try to get to you, as many of you as, as possible. Uh, and unfortunately, it's just going to be one bite at the apple, so to speak, okay. Uh, and if you have a question, uh, you may want, we can give you a follow-up on that. And uh, the NRC has also told me that besides the comments that are going to come in, the written comments, that if you send the question into them, that they will, they will try to answer that question. So if you don't get a chance tonight, we'll do that. And uh, let's, let's go to Donna Gilmore. Donna? Um, hi, I've been studying uh, the issue, and uh, what Jean said is correct. We, we do not have a defense in depth system. We have uh, 5 8 inch thick stainless steel that's the only thing keeping us from having um, a radiological accident that could result in us evacuating. Um, the canisters are subject to something called stress corrosion cracking. We, we do not know of any of the canisters that are currently at San Onofre. We don't know if they have corrosion on them. We don't know if they have stress corrosion cracking because uh, they haven't looked at any of them. It's too dangerous for the workers t to do that. Um, the canisters cannot be repaired. Uh, we're looking at potentially replacing canisters. There's no money in the decommissioning fund for replacing canisters. There are canisters used in Europe and other countries um, that are much thicker, up to 20 inches thick, uh, that were designed for maintenance, that were designed to be able to replace them when and if they wear out and the ones we have are welded, weren't designed being opened. Um, their part of the plan is to get rid of the pools. If we needed to replace a canister, we need the pools, but the NRC plans to allow them to get rid of them. So, uh, you know, I am not happy with this plan. I've got a website, sananofreesafety.org, uh, and I've been keeping track of this. Everything is resourced with technical documents. Oh, there was a lot of misinformation in the presentations, a lot of half-truths in the presentations. Um, uh, so I encourage you to check the San Onofre uh, Safety website uh, to learn the part that was left out of this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Uh, let's go to Rochelle. Rochelle Bell. I'd like to frame my comments on several C, uh, NRC regulations that you pointed out that you're going to follow in this process. The problem with you pointing out that you have NRC regulations, policies, processes, is a recent OIG report that said that didn't work when you replaced the steam generators. So I have no idea why we're supposed to trust you with the back end of the nuclear in industry. You didn't do the job right. You didn't require a license amendment request. We are sitting in the Public Utilities Commission trying to decide how much Edison gets, how much ratepayers get back. Ratepayers are disgusted with this process. When the NRC fails, it is my wallet that this money comes out of, not yours. When Edison fails, they try to argue that shareholders deserve more money than ratepayers. Ratepayers have very little input in this process. Ratepayers pay virtually every penny of this process. We are very tired of you telling us you have a policy, a procedure, a process that works. You don't. And we don't know that until it fails. And when it fails, we pay. And we're tired of doing so. And Mara? Thank you. I don't even know where to begin. Uh, I have the 
environmental impact report here that hasn't even been talked about that anyone who reads it knows that it has to be old information. It can't possibly be what we know today about the hazards for San Onofre becoming a long-term nuclear waste dump. I'm asking so much that you, both in Edison and our Nuclear Regulatory Commission, actually get involved with not passing the buck, not saying it's not our fault, we just have to stick to what we have uh, as our possibilities. I see that the regulation on the re-licensing these casts that now can't even possibly la last with salt corrosion on the ocean as long as you're going to allow them to stay there, even if it's the minimum of 40 years. It's not until spring that your 1927 regulation is going to talk about how we even take care of the process of checking these. We know now we don't have a way to. I'm asking for leadership at all levels and changes of the law. We can't leave that fuel on the ocean. It has to be moved. The fact that this plan is backwards. It, it, it is decommissioning the contamination that most of us could survive first with our $2 billion. They've changed even the term so that it seems like it's more important. None of us care if those domes go away. We've gotten used to seeing them. We're not going near them. Leave them and leave the money in the ratepayers trust fund until all the fuel is off of location somewhere away from the ocean. It is dangerous every day. We have both security that I ask you to look for. You say you can't approve, but you do get to change. You get to give waivers. Don't reduce the security. Don't force an inspection of the 50 casts already there. Don't change the ratepayer trust fund priority leave all four billion dollars there until all the fuel is gone. And please make sure that we don't lose priority in the, the government DOE coming to get our fuel by some way of Edison and the DOE changing the priority. We need your help. We need our legislators' help. Let's get it moved to a place in the desert, away from the ocean, help having the DOD help us get it there now, tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we're going to go to to Kathy Allen. Good evening. My name is Kathy Allen. I work at Agewell Senior Services in South Orange County. We serve approximately 400,000 seniors annually in South Orange County. And I have, a, I have, on behalf of them, I have a two-part question for the NRC. What is the NRC's process over time that there are enough funds available to maintain the dry cast storage on site indefinitely? until the DOE resolves the regulatory issue. What frequency do you perform an analysis? And what is the level of effort? Thank you. Uh, when you say level of effort, can you just explain that a little bit? The level of effort for your analysis. Financial analysis. Financial okay, do you, uh, do you understand analysis. the question, Larry? No, I'll just say, is it financial analysis? Okay, so we're talking about finances. Can we, uh, who wants to, to give a? Mike, Mike Duzanewski is going to Okay, this is Mike Duzanewski. Mike. Good evening, my name is Michael Duzanewski. I'm an economist with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and I am charged with making sure that the kinds of question that the last question uh, was raised is my responsibility and my team's responsibility to ascertain the reasonableness that there will be enough funds 
to decommission and to take care of spent nuclear fuel for the foreseeable future. The point that must be remembered is that the spent fuel is really the property of the Department of Energy. Once it leaves the San Ofre nuclear generating station's footprint, it is no longer in the custody of the licensee. Until that time, there is enough funds to take care of the foreseeable future. Now, as far as what the lady is asking is what happens beyond a certain period of time, I will be frank and honest with you. Whatever possibilities may happen into the future, which all of us can postulate their own <coughs> possibilities, we have to reason only with what is reasonable to what is required by the regulations and what the Department of Energy's foreseeable future is at stake. I'm going to have to say something you're not going to like, and that is the fact that if you postulate some possibilities that the funds do run out, the solutions will not be popular. The financial solutions will not be popular. But the point that must be remembered is that the NRC does not regulate commerce. That is under the jurisdiction of the State Public Utility Commission, and it is our responsibility to make sure that all activities are done safely and completely. And we recognize that safety takes money. Therefore, the NRC will not compromise on any level the safety of taking care of the decommissioning and the spent fuel nuclear, excuse me, the spent fuel that's on site. As far as how often we do the analysis, by regulation, the licensees have to submit to us certain fin financial information that we, that we look at to make sure that the foreseeable forecast is reasonable. We want to make sure that the money is used exclusively for decommissioning. We check this once a year. We also check on how much money is left. We keep checking on this until the license is terminated. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, could you go to this gentleman here, this gentleman here, and then to Ace and Sharon Hoffman, and then we're going to take a break and come back. Yes, sir. Thank you. In, in regards to the economic analysis that you're performing, um, I want to know if the NRC and you specifically, sir, that just answered the question, have you taken into account that recently at Diablo Canyon, you found the um, the conditions for stress, stress corrosion cracking after only two years in the cask. And you certified, the NRC certified these, that they would be good for 30 years. Now, my guess is, sir, that that two years takes your analysis and puts it on its head. And I want to know if you've considered that. Furthermore, Tom, you've got some stones talking about the California Public Utility Commission with all the news in the paper today about how they're under investigation and how they're submitting all their paperwork. Really? Now, as far as the car analysis goes, <clears throat> the cast that you guys are considering won't crack for, excuse me, the, cra the cast that you won't consider won't crack in a marine environment. <clears throat> Again, the cast that you guys are refusing to consider have the ability to be repaired. Everybody wants to repair their car. We also want the cast to be repaired. The cast that you are not considering do not have the ability to inspect the exterior of the canister. You're saying that the industry has to come up with this solution in five years. But the NRC has given time and time again extensions to these kind of rules. We want it done now before it is approved. You guys, or the NRC, excuse me, the, early, the, the, the cast that you guys are not considering do not have an early warning system before radiation leak, i.e., you have no oil light for your car. That's a major problem. You're expecting the public to accept the fact that you're going to go around and kick the tires on the car to ensure that there's a, some sort of integrity. That's a joke. finish up, sir. Thank you. All right. Uh, let me, is, is Val here? Oh, good. Val is, uh, tries to keep control of uh, Local 89. 
Thank you, sir. Yeah, th that's not a hard task to do is take care of Local 89. Local 89 has been taking care of the power plant for many years. Local 89 was involved in the process since day one, Unit 1, Unit 2, uh, decommissioning of Unit 1 as well, and then the building um, before the decommission of Unit 1 of uh, the Units 2 and 3. With that said, being said, I just want to start off by saying thank you for allowing me to be a part of the community engagement panel. It's been an education for me to better represent my members. Um, I hate to use the word my members, our, uh, Local 89's membership, because I've heard, I've heard different opinions from both sides, and I respect everybody, and I've heard a lot of safety concerns come into play. My background, uh, in the early 90s, I was involved in the decommissioning of a uranium uh, enriched, U-235 uh, enriched uranium processing plant in Sorrento Valley. Um, of course, NRC was involved, Bechtel was the contract at the time, so I'm very familiar with the decommissioning process at that, at that scale. This is a much larger scale. I'm thankful to be a part of the CEP panel. I want to I wanted disclose something here. For years, for years, Southern California Edison has a huge amount of respect from me for the safety that has been put in place for our membership, for allowing me to be a part of, a part of the CEP panel. It goes beyond that as far as safety goes. Local 89 is engaged in training. A lot of the members here that are here today don't have orange shirts on. There's no need to try to control the membership. They're honest people, they're rate payers that built the power plant, that have the same voice as other people, and we're gonna continue to respect everybody. Those members that have been laid off, lost their jobs because of the, the, the power plant going down is understandable. But make no mistake, these members have gone through a serious curriculum in, in terms of training on a daily basis. We have a large training facility. We have mobile sites for not only uh, Southern California Edison, San Onofre decommissioning, but other contractors and other sectors of the market as well. And I, I just want to say that um, I'm very thankful for the professionals to put all the information together for allowing us to be a part of the process. And let's, let's give these members back their jobs. There's this, these professionals are disclosing full-on information that's beneficial to the safety and the decommissioning of this project. And I ask that you vote and get this thing going and let's put these people back to work and let's, ha let's, let's continue to have SCE allow whichever vendor, whichever contractor steps up to the plate and becomes the awarding body for the decommissioning project to follow the safety process that it's had for years and make sure that all of our members and anybody else that joins whichever union that goes into the decommissioning of this project that allows them to go home safe to their families. I thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We're going to hear from Gary Hedrick. We're going to go to Ace and Sharon. We're going to take a break quick for 10 minutes. And we're going to come back, and we're going to we're going to keep going. Gary, thank you. Can you hear me? There we go. Uh, my name's Gary Hedrick, founder of San Clemente Green, and we've been concerned about our safety ever since being contacted by some of the great workers at San Onofre, who we have a lot of respect and concern for. Um, just one note about Val. I, you know, we had a conversation shortly after the plan was announced to be shut down and Val was concerned that the NR, that he was being reassigned to uh, fight fires when he hadn't been trained to do that in a radiological environment, but I think he's since been trained, so I'm glad that's happened. But the point I want to make about um, what I've heard tonight is actually the most encouraging words I've heard is that you're trying to keep ahead of this. You're recognizing that you're not ahead of this issue about how we're gonna deal with the nuclear waste on site and deal with it safely, and I appreciate that. But the problem is we're still rushing ahead to uh, this expedite this decommissioning thing, which we all wanna see happen as quick as possible, but we all agree that it has to be as safe as possible. And I believe that you need to seriously look at this problem longer and not um, 
not play word games about whether you approve it or not. You are the regulators, you make the regulations, and you're also guilty of make, making exemptions for regulations whenever the industry wants it. And that's a real problem you have to get over if you want to earn the public's trust. So, I'm appealing to Tom Palmasano, who I appreciate and respect in, in depth. Uh, I think Edison is the one who we can thank for having shut down the nuclear power plant and done the responsible thing when the NRC did not step in and do I mean, to prevent them from restarting a broken reactor without fixing it first. Uh, you know, so Tom, please give us some time. Let's look at that more sturdy cask system. Let's not rush into this. Regardless of what the NRC decides, uh, we need you to do the right thing. And we're putting a lot of faith in you. We got to get this right. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. And uh, Ace, why don't you come here so that they can get you on the camera? Okay, go ahead. Uh, I agree that the, uh, the people who worked at that plant were good all along. I've been fighting them for 20 years. I've never had a problem at any of these meetings. Nobody's ever come up to me and said anything nasty or mean. I think they're all good people. And if we, re if we decommission that plant right now, one of them is going to die on average because of the difference in the amount of radiation that's going to be, they're going to be exposed to. And I wonder if they're ready to pick which one of them it's going to be, or whether it's going to be a multitude of them that are going to get some kind of cancer. Now, that's what's going to happen, because the NRC's own statistics say that there's going to be a couple of hundred rem uh, dosage if we do it now, and it's only going to be a couple of dozen rem if we do it later. So I'd like to see us wait. But what I'd really like to talk about is that 5 eighths inch, five eighths inch thick protection against a, uh, a, a a ra that's the radiological barrier for the next 60 years, is that 5 8 inch stainless steel. The, the 3 to 5 inches of concrete is virtually irrelevant because it's designed with vents. So if something gets in there and damages the, the, uh, the casks, we're going to have a problem. ISIS is training six-year-old kids to be suicidal terrorists. ISIS is interested in a multi-generational attack against America. ISIS is producing videos in which they are recruiting people in order to attack America. Now, Tom, I'm sure that you're aware that there are many, many weapons that can go through 5 eighths inches of steel. This is a multitude of them. We have to protect that plant better. We can't pretend that, this, that just because we're no longer a, a nuclear power plant, that we're no longer a target. We're most definitely a target because of where we are and who we are and because of our freedoms and because we can have a meeting like this. This makes us vulnerable. So you have to consider not just the things that they tell you to consider, but everything that your heart tells you to consider. That, that's really all I have to say. This is pr practically the last meeting that, that we're going to need to attend here. And I want to thank all the workers at San Onofre. I don't believe any one of them did a bad job. Thanks, Ace. Yes. And uh, last uh, commenter before the break is uh, Sharon. Good evening, everybody. And thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak tonight. I have a, a few questions. Um, the first question is really kind of simple. Does anybody have the ability to say no? In a business environment, there's a big difference between the people who say, can say yes and the people who can say no. And I didn't hear anybody from the NRC say, I'm the guy. I can say no. I can say stop. I can say we need more information. And I think that's important. Somebody should be able to say no. I also want to say to the gentleman who spoke about the finances that realistically, assuming that the DOE is going to take all the fuel from San Onofre by 2052 is not realistic. If you look back to 1988, say, we would have said all that fuel that has already been accumulated would be gone by now, and it's not. So let's be more realistic than that. And last but not least, let's not be in a rush 
to put this fuel into casks. It, keeping it in the pools gives us an opportunity to observe it, gives us, gives SCE and the NRC the opportunity to learn something about the aging of casks. We're talking about leaving fuel in casks for hundreds if not thousands of years and we have no experience in that. So what's the rush? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sharon. Please introduce yourself. Hello, uh, my name is Chris Johnston. I thank you all for coming and um, I want to believe that your safety recommendation is number one. And I'm concerned about our community. I'm concerned about eight and a half million people. I would not want to be sitting in your shoes. Uh, you have a, a very grave responsibility before you. Um, I have concerns about the canisters, as other people have expressed. The new homes canister that's five eighths inch thick, that you have done some salt spray uh, testing on at Diablo Canyon and found stress corrosion cracking. And we are talking about atmospheric uh, corrosion here at San Onofre. Uh, so deeply concerned that these casks, these canisters, are not going to withstand atmospheric pressure. And beyond that, I'm also wondering, um, and I believe this is a question for Al, um, regarding the seismic rating for cracked canisters. Can you answer that? Is it on? Is it on? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. First of all, let me get to your uh, one point you mentioned about seeing stress corrosion cracking at the elbow. It has not happened. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it it know, has a potentiality there has been, to happen. There, there, there are chlorides there. Mm -hmm. Okay. There are chlorides that were found at Calvert Cliffs. There were chlorides that were found at um, Hope Creek as well. They were on brackish water. Diablo is right there on the coast. That's one of the reasons why they, the EPRI uh, went ahead and did that analysis or went ahead and had a volunteer sites. The, these three were volunteers, okay? They didn't need to do it. They weren't required to do it. They just volunteered to do it, mm -hmm. okay? So that showed a lot of st stewardship on their part to do that. Now, about two weeks ago, all right, so about uh, July, we held a public meeting. We went out there and showed our cards and we said, this is the aging management program that we want for stainless steel canisters, period, okay? That it required inspections, that required operational experience evaluations, that, inquired, that required corrective actions, quality assurance, all that, okay? Two, uh, let's see here, but that meeting was, after that meeting, there was another meeting on chloride, stress corrosion, cracking. And uh, I know several folks were on that phone call. Okay, that meeting went very long. We were kicked out of the room because we had so many questions, which is great. I, was, I talked to Donna after that meeting about these issues. Okay, uh, that meeting was the prelude to the report that EPRI was about to provide. Okay, now that report was was published two weeks ago. Okay, it's called it. the flaw. No, that's a different one. I think the flaw evaluation and growth calculations. Have you heard of that one? No. Let me give that to you. Uh, you can go to Every's website, and uh, let me pull it up here. Oh, it's back here. It's uh, report number three zero zero two zero zero two seven eight five. Do you want me to repeat that? Yeah. I, I, yeah. It's. <laughs> I'll be watching the. Uh, She's got so, it. Yeah. So in that report, they did a calculation, a much more sophisticated calculation than what we had intended to do. We just did a, a quick calc, okay, for Calvert specific. Now what they evaluated is they looked at all the conditions. They went to the uh, Camp Pendle Pendle was it Pendleton? Pendleton site here, okay? And they pulled out all the information on uh, the atmospherics, uh, the, the weather and everything. Pulled out uh, some of the calcs that they were that they did were very were very sophisticated based on that. Their worst case scenario, okay. This is there's two you got to remember there's two two K, two two stages of stress corrosion cracking for chlorides. There's the incubation period where you get all the environments you get all the the, the conditions that could start cracking, okay. Then you have the actual crack growth, okay. There's two stages, okay. 
incubation plus initiation and then crack growth. They just only looked at crack growth. They did not look at how long it would take to get to that stage because just having chlorides there is not sufficient to have cracking to start. Okay? You need to be in a relative humidity environment. You need to have the material conditions. You need to have a lot of things that have to play out to get this start of cracking. We raised this issue nearly nine, ten years ago. Okay? We're at this stage now. That we're, we're, we're trying to act on it. The cows that came out, okay, and I'm going to give, it, give these, these numbers to you, okay, for ambient plus 15 degrees, that means 70 degrees plus 15 degrees Celsius, so it's about, what, 20, 25 degrees Fahrenheit, roughly, um, to get a 50% through wall crack. And this is just not assuming how long it takes to start to get the incubation period to begin. That could take years to decades, okay? You have 18.2 years, okay, by their calcs to go through wall of a half inch thick canister. <coughs> to go through wall, completely through wall, it's 60 years, over 60 years, <coughs> okay? To go 75% through wall, it's about 40 years. Mm -hmm. Okay, now if you take it to the 5 8 inch canister, okay, you're talking about worst case now, worst case, 28 years to go halfway through wall. And to go full through wall, over 86 years. Okay, so I want you to understand that this is the, we're, we're trying to get ahead of this. Okay, what that's what I'm trying to say. What is your defense in depth in that case, if it does happen? If it does happen, you know, this is why we're doing the inspections. Okay. How can uh, you inspect canisters that can't be inspected? Well, you, you mentioned it. They, they already did inspections at Diablo, and I mentioned Hope Creek, and I mentioned the volunteer inspections there. There are also, Calvert Cliffs did an uh, uh, inspection for their license renewal. Oconee and Surrey did as well. Okay, Those you're are saying visual you can go exams. all around the canisters and you can well, and see everything, so every potential crack. Part of what, well, what we do here, and that's where in the meeting that we had uh, that was back in that July time frame, we talked about a Coburg plant, okay? That was a South African plant. Donna, you showed me that slide that I showed you earlier that we had at that meeting. The Coburg plant had cracking in a 304 uh, um, a tank and a pipe, okay? And they went ahead and inspected and they repaired it, okay? So there are repair technologies and we have seen inspection technologies that are out there, okay? Okay, now back to the final question is the seismic, uh, the seismic yes, rating so for seismic. five canisters back So we did, we did a calc on Thank that. you, Chris, seismic. So let me talk about the calc on seismic, all right? Um, what San Onofre did is they analyzed to six, six Gs, which is 10 times what their design basis was for, for this 1029 system. We went ahead and analyzed for the loads that would occur for the 6G, so that's 10 times what a earthquake would be here, for, what the design basis earthquake, okay, 10 times that. You would have to lose over 80% of the entire canister thickness, the entire canister thickness, before you would have any issues, okay, for a 10 times seismic. That's the robustness in this design. Okay? That's what I'm trying to get across, that this design and these systems are so over-designed for these types of conditions. Okay? Now, yes, you know, we don't want to ever get to a crack that is 75% through wall. Okay? That's why we're doing this inspection. That's why we're doing these aging management plans. That's why we're trying to get ahead of this. Okay? The, first, um, the, fir the renewal for San Onofre will be in 2023. Okay? 2023 is right around the corner. All right, at that time, we will inspect probably the worst, the worst in terms of our environmental uh, our, you know, evaluation. EPRI, as part of Electric Power Research Institute that did this flaw evaluation study, is doing a compendium that's coming out this year sometime, okay? That's looking at the environmental factors, the prioritization. And from that, we're going to prioritize which canisters, how we can focus our inspections on a specific canister, okay? At that time, that's what we're going to be doing for by the time that San Onofre comes around, this technology will have been used, okay? We have put into the Calvert Cliffs uh, renewal, we have put in there what they need to be able to inspect, okay, within the three years. Okay, thank you, and we did get an extension till 20 after nine, okay, so we have some more time, but one other suggestion is, uh, and this all depends on Al's goodwill and schedule and all that stuff, but we need to be out of this room by 20 after 9, but there's no reason why you can't have an informal 
conference with, with Al out there somewhere, okay? So I'm glad you're not listening, Al, because I got you committed. Okay, great. Um, let's go to Kevin, Kevin Blanche back here, and then we're going to spend some time here, go to Richard McPherson, we'll go over that side of the room. Kevin? Well, I want to first say that the NRC, which I call you guys the nuclear rallying cheerleaders, I don't want any of you to take this personal, what I'm about to say. And I would be more than happy, I'm staying at the hotel, to sit down and have a beer with any one of you. And I'll even buy, because we always buy. I've been fighting San Onofre since I was a little boy. I was given two months to live three years ago. My father was nuked to death in the Nevada test site from Pendleton. I've been anti-nuclear. I want to ask this simple question to the NRC, and again, do not take this personally. I call you the nuclear rallying cheerleaders. You have no congressional powers whatsoever, none. You are the, a nuclear regulatory commission. You are not the executive branch, you are not the legislative branch, you are not the judicial branch, none of the above. Congress makes law, not you. And when you come out and slide in and say, oh, we're turning America into American toxic, we're going to take every one of these catastrophes, which is the biggest mistake in human history called nuclearism, and turn them into official nuclear waste dump sites. Only Congress has that ability to do that, not you, not the NRC. I know Allison. I'm glad Allison resigned. And hopefully on November 4th, maybe Harry Reid, who's protected from putting this monster in Yucca Mountain, which Congress and was promised to put in Yucca Mountain. I sat right here in the 60s. And listen to these same ridiculous conversations about what we're going to do with the waste, where we're going to put it. That stuff needs to come off that cliff yesterday. <clears throat> San Onofre is the poster child for everything wrong with the nuclear industry. It is a catastrophe, and if it was up to the nuclear rally cheerleaders, it was all the grassrooters. And I would like to say thank you and get this into the public domain to the grassroot activists in Southern California. I live in Utah which you parked the generator in my backyard illegally. I would like to say thanks to Gene, Ace, all these people that have fought this tooth and nail. It was us as grassrooters that exposed the lies that was going on by PG&E, the great crimes against humanity. You protected them. The lie on the exchange of the generator, these crimes against humanity that were taking place. You are not Congress. Yucca Mountain's a bad idea. Shooting in space is a bad idea. But I'll tell you what's really a bad idea. Nuclear. Building a nuclear site on a cliff, on the most beautiful beach in the world, on a cliff, and then storing the waste there for 40 years when it's not built to spare the waste. Dry cast is a catastrophe. It's a pathetic, stupid idea. Yeah, Yucca Mountain's pathetic, but Congress passed Yucca Mountain. You're not Congress. Ship it to Yucca Mountain. Yeah, I know that's a horrible debate. And Congress can't get anything done. But we still have a Constitution. And it was approved and passed to be in Yucca Mountain decades ago. And Harry Reid blocks it. Yeah, I understand. Born and raised at Yucca Mountain. He has to get elected. His power. But again, don't take this any of it personally, but I consider the NRC to be nothing but a group of criminals who protect other criminals. Sound off your criminals. Period. Period. What they pulled on the exchange, the crimes against humanity, nuclear fog is leukemia. My father died of it, and now I'm fighting for my life with it. So many are. That stuff needs to come off that cliff before we get an earthquake. Dry cast, whatever, it will not stay there. It is a catastrophe ticking time bomb. Thank you. Okay, Kevin. Uh, we're going to go to Alan. Uh, my name is Alan Wu. I'm with the Asian Pacific Planning Council of Orange County. I used to be chair of the um, Low Income Oversight Board with the CPUC. Um, so I understand a little about the ratepayer and, and, and what uh, regulatory agencies kind of look at. I, I kind of appreciate uh, Southern California, Edison Road, in making a decision to uh, stop operation. They did that uh, voluntarily. There might have been some encouragement, but nevertheless, here we are, right? Uh, we're closed. We shut, the, shut it down. We're trying to come up with a plan to contain it, store it, and then go forward as those policies that the federal government has to yet uh, come into place. Um, something has to be done now because I, I did a calculation when 2052 would be. That's 38 years from now. 
I may not be around, and maybe most of you guys are not going to be around, and most of the activists here won't be around too, but we leave in place what we start today, and I could appreciate that uh, you thought about inspections, you thought about containment, you thought about storage, you thought about all these things, and that each one of you pledged that you're going to become good stewards in terms of making sure of the future. So at least now, I can see the faces of people who are committed uh, to doing something, to decommission it in a responsible way, to contain this uh, situation that we have, and to move forward. I don't know what's going to happen in 38, 40 years, who may be sitting up there, if there's anyone, uh, whether anyone cares in Washington or, or whatever. But I know today, you know, there's people in the community that cares. I know that we have a utility company that cares and been transparent and has been talking to us in the community about the impact on us. And you had a lot of workers here who needs to go back to work, uh, who, who, who knows and care how to clean up this thing. So. Um, that's all I like to say. I just think that you presented a large plan here. It covers every uh, area, including environmental impact. We just got to see if we don't start now and we postpone it. You know, you're just postponing a problem. You're not getting started. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Donya. Good evening. My name is Donya Moore. I'm with the San Clemente Chamber of Commerce. I'd like to thank the NRC and Edison for having this forum and allowing us to speak here. Um, I am aware, of course, as you discussed often tonight, that the uh, NRC gave Edison 60 years to do the decommissioning process, and they voluntarily decided to do it in, on a 20-year timeline, which I think is very commendable. Um, and I understand the need to remove the um, the waste that's at st being stored currently at San Onofre. However, I have a question, and that is that one of the things that hasn't really come up much is that, as I understand it, it's actually the federal government that is the, the body that is giving permission to remove the, the waste and, and as where to put it, and there's no repository at this moment and I haven't heard anything about when there will be a repository to remove the waste too. So it's great to talk about removing the, the, the nuclear waste, but how are we gonna do that if we don't have any place to store it? And as I understand it, that's up to the federal government. Is that correct? Should we go to uh, Keith McConnell for a little bit of history on this? Uh, this is Keith McConnell, who was the director of the Waste Confidence Directorate who did the environmental impact statement and rulemaking called Continued Storage. But Keith, do you want to provide some information to Donia on that? Yes, it is the uh, Department of Energy's responsibility to uh, manage the disposition of spent nuclear fuel from all the power plants across the country. Uh, the Department of Energy's most recent uh, issuance on terms of a repository was uh, put out in January of 2013. What they envisioned at, at that uh, time was a staged process where there would be a uh, pilot effort to, to take the spent fuel to a centralized interim storage facility, and then there would be a full-scale interim storage facility in the 2020, mid-2020s timeframe, and then a, um, a process where they would go through uh, and solicit um, uh, interest in the development of a geologic repository other than Yucca Mountain. And that's all in this strategy that they issued in uh, 2013. Now there is uh, legislation required to allow that strategy, strategy to proceed. Uh, and it also depends on community involvement and uh, state involvement in terms of looking for a repository. But that repository would not be available until the 2048 time frame, and that ties into the, uh, the presentation uh, that San Onofre gave uh, today. So do, does that help? Yes, thank you. I just thank you, Keith. Uh, and let's, let's go to Heather and Steve, and then we're going to go to Richard, and then we'll go over to Ray and everybody over there. Heather. My name is Heather Johnson. I'm the executive director of the Dana Point Chamber of Commerce. 
Um, and I'm interested in um, more of the process. So um, my question is, is what will be the daily responsibilities of the NRC resident inspector? How are their activities change as the project progresses? And how are you gonna communicate that to the community and to our local businesses? I think that's probably a question for me. There's currently a senior resident on site. Uh, that person stayed on site after uh, San Onofre had shut down. Uh, long term, that position will not be there uh, day to day, but will be a regional based inspector that will be in concert, or not in concert, but in contact with the licensee. And they will be aware of any of the higher risk activities as well as uh, the activities the licensee is undertaking. So the resident inspector will, will not be there, but the inspector from the region, the teams and individuals will be going out and performing the inspections, particularly based on the higher risk activities. Now, what I mean by that is, uh, as the licensee prepares to uh, move the fuel from the uh, spent fuel pool to the isthmus, that would be a higher risk activity. Some of the uh, dismantlement of the different systems that had uh, radiation and radioactivity would also be a higher risk activity. So we would have inspectors that would be there and watch those higher risk activities as well as uh, I tried to explain during the presentation there are certain um, aspects of the the day-to-day -day operations that also are inspected on a routine basis such as uh, the organization of the licensee, how they maintain the business, how they perform uh, their audits, how they perform their self-valuations. All those are looked at and they're planned in advance and the inspection teams would go out and inspect those as well as the higher risk activities. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Is this Laurie? Yes. Okay, why don't we stop here? Go ahead. Okay. Hi. Um, I would like to ask the question of this gentleman on the end here. Okay. The gentleman on the end here made a made a statement about um, dose rates and um, you said that you compared it to background radiation in certain areas of the world and I just wanted to state that what's in the cast up there at San Onofre is not background radiation. It's the most dangerous man-made radionuclides in the world and you can't compare that to background. And if the rest of the NRC stands <coughs> behind that statement, then that's a criminal act. And you're talking about Mr. Camper on the end. Larry, do you want to clarify anything on that yeah, one? Yeah, I, I will. Thank you for the question. What, what I was trying to do was to draw a comparison as to what it means in our standard that we require. When that site is ultimately decommissioned, it has to meet that those standard to be released. And that's 25 millirem in Alera. When I was trying to give some perspective on what is 25 millirem, because a lot of folks look at that and they say, well, what is 25 millirem? So I've tried to draw a comparison. If you get on an airplane, you fly up to New York, it's three millirem. There are, the natural background radiation in the United States, as I said, is 300 to 600 millirem, depending on where you are. I agree. I beg your pardon? I agree with that. I, I agree with your point fully. You're, if you're saying that uh, there's a dose con... Sorry? Oh, I agree with you fully. It's not background radiation. Of course. Okay. Sounds like there's some agreement here, but let's, let's let Larry finish and then we're going to go to some, some other people. Thank you, Larry. Larry. No, I, I agree with you that it's not background radiation. I was simply trying to draw some reference to what 25 millirem meant when that site is decommissioned to satisfy that dose standard. Okay, uh, Steve? Uh, Richard, and I'm here too. Hi, I'm Steve Adams, uh, resident at Laguna Niguel. Um, and uh, reading through the report, I had a question, a couple of questions. Um, the term islanding of the, the pool, the spent fuel pools uh, was used and I'm not, clear on what islanding would be in those pools. And then my next question is based on listening to some of the previous um, commentations. It, it, is, it, is it safer for the spent fuel to be in pools or is it safer for it to be in the cask that are 
proposed right now. Well, those are good questions. And who would like to take the island name on? So let, let, me, let me take that on because I think that came off our slides. Okay. That, that is a term that refers to taking the current spent fuel pool cooling system, which are installed plant equipment that will be taken out of service. When we say islanding, that means putting in dedicated standalone cooling systems for the spent fuel pools. So we essentially island it and separate it from, disconnect it from the rest of the installed plant equipment. That's what the term islanding means. Okay. Okay, and does anybody want to talk to the, to the question that's been percolating for a while now about is it safer in pools or dry storage? Okay, um, so the, our, our requirements of both, both processes we have, to be, have to be safe and, the, and, and so we consider them and we looked at them in the past, you know, to see, you know, is there, is there benefits one way or the other? Um, and there was, recent, there was a recent study that was actually put up to the commission to, or to our commission to, to see whether, whether there was a need for there to be an expedited transfer of fuel from the spent fuel pools to, to dry cast storage. And the determination was that, it, it, that there is no, there's no, um, no real benefit from that standpoint uh, to, to do it in, in an expedited manner, so to get it, get it there sooner. In some cases, you can't actually take the fuel and put it into spent in dry cast storage uh, within a, yeah, until after a certain amount of time because it just can't get into the cast. The cast can't handle the amount of heat that's going to be generated by that, so it has to stay in the spent fuel pools. But the spent fuel pools are, are built to be uh, very, um, very uh, uh, rugged structures that, that are going to withstand the same seismic types of loads and, and such that, a, that the cast would have to be able to withstand as well. Um, to be able to, to, to um, dissipate the heat in the same manner as, as the cast would, but just through a different process. They're, they're dissipating it through, through the water that they're, they're in, whereas the casts are, are, are dissipating it through the, the transfer of, into the air or the, the atmosphere that's within, within the casts themselves. So it's a different process. And I think the specific reference was to terror. I mean, is, is let me, let me, just, this will be the last question, but go ahead. No, I, I was referring to the, the comment that was made about like a terrorist attack. Is, is it be, being in a pool, is that safer than being encased in stainless steel and concrete? Right. So um, from the standpoint of terrorist attacks, um, obviously with, with, you can't quanti it's very difficult to quantify what type of a terrorist attack has to occur. So what we've tried to do, what we've done is, 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 is establish what's called a design basis threat. And that's a, a, a threat that um, has been established to provide assurance, of a high, very, very high assurance of, of that they're going to be able to, the licensee would be able to thwart a, an adversary coming in to, and then attacking it. So that's what the, from a terrorist standpoint, our, our, our defense in depth is to ensure that they have a good strong security program to ensure that the terrorists are not going to be successful in whatever attack that they would do. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Richard McPherson. Good evening. Um, I hear a lot of negative information, about 90% of the people are talking negatively about uh, nuclear power, something they don't really know about. Fifty years ago, I suited up in NICs for the first time, and I was participated in a defueling of a reactor and a refueling of a reactor. And I've been involved in that process ever since. I was even selected to represent the United States at the International Atomic Energy Agency for four years on something called nuclear fuel cycle facilities, which is the front end and the back end, the environment and public opinion. And I've now been involved for almost 51 years in nuclear power. I have uh, little or no concerns over what you're presenting here because I've seen it presented so many times and I've seen it be successful. It's unfortunate that there's so much misinformation out there and there's so much misinformation that's generated on purpose to cause fear in people. But as, a, as an operator of five nuclear power plants and been involved in refuelings and been involved in the back end of the fuel cycle since 19, a lot since 1992, I appreciate everything you're saying and doing and I think we're gonna be safe. Thank you very much.
Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, good evening. I'm Richard Gardner from Capistrano Beach. Uh, I feel that uh, the process is in place to lead us to a safe condition, even though I think I agree with everyone that getting the spent fuel out of the off the site and in a permanent repository would probably be the long-term benefit, and that's not in your hands. What I am here to suggest is that the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station should be repurposed into a reverse osmosis drinking water facility, at least for the intake structures and the turbine buildings. And I believe that, you know, without actually doing the, you know, a, a preliminary design, that it would be easy to have 50 million gallons a day or 100 million gallons a day. And that water would be provided and it would, it would be adequate supplies for the, the, the Marine Corps that live on the base and also it would satisfy the, uh, the demands of at least 25% of South Orange County, which, goes, uh, which covers a great distance. So I think that's a much higher and more important use considering if this drought does not, if we don't get some rain pretty soon, we could be drawing the Lake Mead down and we may be in a position where we would have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people dependent on a water source that isn't there. So that's why I think it would be best if there was a planning, a planning, uh, facility where we would look at um, a contingency of converting or repurposing the plant and doing it in a way that the transition could occur to whoever the third party is, it could be Southern Cal Edison, but it could be anyone else, uh, and that the discussions with the Navy happen immediately so that we could save this Southern Cal Edison over $130 million for the demo of the turbine buildings alone. And we would save the Water Authority another $100 million for the new facilities. And you know, the, the plant here in Carlsbad is costing $1 billion for, for an RO plant to produce 50 million gallons a day. So we could have that, and, it, and I think we should begin to focus on that's more important uh, than many of the things that we are now concerned about that are hypothetical. So if, if anyone can figure out how to get through the right departments within the federal government and, and in the state to think about how it affects Southern Cal Edison's planning process, I would like to be actively involved. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's go over here to, uh, let's go to Ray. And then we'll go to. Uh... Okay, hello. My name is Ray Lutz. I'm with citizensoversight.org. Uh, I wanted to bring up some of the things that concern the public about the process and uh, where we are today. Uh, I'm one of those that are very happy that the plan is shut down. I don't think that nuclear power is a good idea, I don't think that it's safe to have all this waste around. That's the definition, the non-definition of green. If you have a whole bunch of waste at the end, it's not green energy. And we have a whole bunch, 3.2 million pounds of high rate, highly radioactive waste that we've got to deal with now. The problem is that it almost seems like we're seat of the pants operation here. Uh, Almost nothing has been really planned ahead. Yeah, you say we've, we've decommissioned all these other plants, but we really don't really have a solution for this fuel still. It's really not a, a good plan yet. And no one is sitting here saying, here's our plan for the next 10, 20, 30 years. There is no plan. All we got is here. That's the end of the plan, a foreseeable future. You say, uh, for the foreseeable, what the hell is that? What is a foreseeable future? 10 years, is that it? Is that the foreseeable future for the NRC? 20 years, I mean, what is foreseeable? Because right now the only plan is leave it here on the coast. Uh, Edison doesn't have a plan for the next 10 years, the next place. Everybody's pointing fingers. Department of Energy is responsibility, not us. 
NRC, we don't even have to approve the damn plan. It's not our responsibility. If it goes south, no, we didn't approve it. That was their problem because we have a, a way out. We've covered our butts. We don't have to approve the plan. Who came up with this? Who came up with the fact that the actual license amendment process is at the very end? Before, after, when everything's done, we finally talk about whether we should approve it. Like in 50 years from now, we're gonna talk about what we did was 50 years ago was okay. The NRC is all backwards. You have the, a license amendment for the termination at the very, very end. Instead of doing it, why did they do that? It's because they said, oh, well, there's gonna be some activists that are gonna be out there and they're gonna put blocks into what we're doing. So I'll tell you what, let's put the license, the license termination plan at the very end so that no one can block it. That's what we're, 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 where we are now. The NRC doesn't even have to approve it. Seat of the pants operation, no approval, no long-term or even 10, 20-year plan. These are all big problems in our, in our minds. The fact that the, the license termination is at the very end of the process. It should have been now. And you're saying we don't have to approve it. My, my proposal is you're gonna have to work around this system. Stop pointing fingers at the Department of Energy. Southern California Edison, thank you for shutting it down. Now you need to do your part by planning. Here's what we're gonna do with the fuel over the next 20, 30 years. Make a plan. It's not gonna be perfect, but at least get it started. NRC, do your part by approving this plan. I don't care if they say it's not your, your you can't approve it. Do it anyway, say we are approving this and you're putting your butt on the line. And I expect you to be able to say we're not approving it and Southern California Edison will cooperate and they'll say, you know what? You guys haven't approved it yet. There's some problems, we're gonna fix those. I'm sure you're gonna, I know Tom Palmasano would love to do that. He would love to fix any problems that you've got. So don't say, oh, it's the end of the clock. We're not done yet, but go ahead. Make sure that everything is done, all the I's are dotted and all the T's are crossed. I think it's right. You know this thing about the fuel pools, the guy just asked, he's not here anymore. That, that study that you said, oh, it's the expediting the fuel out of the fuel pools into the dry cast, the only reason they said that was because of cost. That wasn't because of a safety issue, and the whole system that you guys use at the NRC is screwed up because you start with the cost Analysis before you've ever gotten done with the, the first, the safety analysis. They jump right away into the cost, beta, whether it's cost effective or not. And so that's why they came up with that. It probably is better to put them in the dry cast. Let's face it, if you have a terrorist attack, the fuel pools are not as safe as the dry cast. And that should be the answer. Uh, sir, you answered that, your answer should be the fuel pools are not as safe as a dry cast in a terrorist attack. Uh, you know, you got to say something. You, you think they're, they're just equally as safe? Okay, I guess we got uh, it. Uh, Is there an answer? I explained that, the, that it's the design basis threat and the licensee has to protect against the design basis threat. And regardless of whether they're attacking the spent fuel pools or they're attacking the cast, they, they, they have to be able to thwart, they have to be able to thwart the, the, the adversary. Okay. So it, and, and then prevent the attack from, hap from being successful. So Thank it doesn't you. matter where they attack. 